Welcome to this week's episode of Future of XYZ. We are speaking about the future of offshore wind. It is a special episode in co-production with Rhode Island Report of the Boston Globe and, of course, with Rhode Island PBS, as always. My co-host, Brian Amaral, and I are speaking with David Hardy, CEO of the Americas and exec- Group Executive Vice President at Orsted, one of the world's largest alternative energy uh, companies, as well as one of the largest, most important offshore wind producers in Rhode Island and across America. First and foremost, what is offshore wind? Yeah, offshore wind is the next major renewable energy growth platform for the world, but specifically for the United States. Um, it's big wind energy, wind turbines that are built offshore, today primarily fixed to the bottom of the sea. Uh, but in the future, potentially on floating platforms as well. And the first offshore wind farm was built by Orsted about 31 years ago in 1991, 32 years wow. ago. Um, the first U.S. wind farm was built about a little over five years ago here in Rhode Island, the Block Island wind farm. That's great. Thank you. So as you know, Rhode Island recently opened up a request for proposals to get a new uh, offshore wind power project. And and just recently, Rhode Island Energy announced that it wasn't going to accept uh, Orsted, move forward with Orsted and Eversource's proposal. Um, what was your reaction to that decision? Was that disappointing that your proposal didn't get picked? Yeah, it was very, very disappointing. I mean, we, we spent a lot of a lot of time uh, preparing our, our, our proposal. At the time, we didn't know we would be the only bidder. I don't, I don't know if your audience knows that, but we ended up being the only bidder. So it, we saw it as a, as a competitive tender, and we, we really p- tried to put our best foot forward, both with a competitive price, but also with a, a good uh, state economic benefits package. Um, and so we were, we were quite disappointed to hear that they decided not to move forward. You know, what do, what do you think it overall says, not, not just that they didn't decided not to move forward with it, but that you were the only bidder on this. What do you think it says about the overall the challenges of the offshore wind power industry right now, and some of the some of the headwinds that it's that it's facing in some in some areas? There's definitely some headwinds. There's some tailwinds as well. So maybe I'll start with a few of the headwinds and 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 a little more positively. Um, you know, uh, offshore wind. Like I said, we were 30 years behind Europe. Uh, they've had a lot of time to build a supply chain, build service service capabilities train people, et cetera. And they've been able to get the price of offshore wind pretty competitive. Um, there's there's no subsidies and it's pretty much grid 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 price for them. Their grid price is a little higher than ours because our natural gas price is, is lower, but pretty reasonable cost of energy f- for for Europe. Um, and, and this is what prompted the U.S. to step in, these more progressive uh, Northeast states, New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, et cetera, New Jersey, I can't leave anybody out or I'll get beat up by, by those governors, Maryland, Connecticut, all of them. Uh, Virginia. They, Virginia, yeah. They, um, they saw the price becoming more and more competitive. And, and so they kicked off these procurement processes. And now the Biden administration likewise saw the benefits of clean energy at, at what every, everybody believed would become a competitive price. The challenge, of course, is that we did start a little bit higher because we're starting from behind. We don't have the supply chain. We don't have the workers. Uh, but and but folks thought that the price would come down, and it was coming down. But then we had these big uh, macroeconomic challenges over the last 18 months with much higher interest rates, much higher input costs, um, price of steel, um, supply and demand imbalance. We talk about supply chain bottlenecks a lot, and people don't know what that means. But if you have you know, a lot of demand for these r- very bespoke vessels that install these massive turbines offshore, the supply chain hasn't caught up with that demand, then these vessel operators can charge, you know, whatever they want, basically, to build to build a project. And so, so unfortunately, that more recently, you've seen um, some quite a, quite a few challenges with some of the, the projects where people bid before these macroeconomic challenges of COVID and U- Ukraine war, um, and now the math doesn't work anymore because their cost of capital is higher and their input costs are higher. So those are the those are the headwinds. That's some of the challenge. And to be honest, we had to take those headwinds into consideration when we put our latest bid in into Rhode Island. And so the price was was higher. We think it's a competitive price, but it was it, it was probably you know by absolute standards higher. Um, we're hopeful though that all this vision that everybody had about building a supply chain, training workers, and getting the economies of scale and getting this industry started will eventually get us back on that low, levelized cost of energy 
reduction path. And we're hopeful also that, you know, things like the infrastructure bill, the IRA can help, um, help incentivize the industry to get, to get started. So those are some of the positive things, uh, that, that, that will help us. And net net, I, I still feel really positive about the industry, but we definitely have some bumpy, bumpy times right now. So. Um, let me ask, I mean, obviously we're talking with Rhode Island Report and we're in Rhode Island and you guys are, Orsted's America's headquarters is co, I think, headquartered here in Rhode Island as well as in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, but when you entered the U.S. market as the first offshore wind company, to, European company to enter the U.S. market in 2015 with the Block Island uh, project, what was it? I mean, you oversee all of Orsted's renewable portfolio here in America. What is it about Rhode Island, however, that made it so appealing and interesting as the first project in America is for, for offshore wind? Well, I think the, the Block Island Wind Farm was actually developed by Deepwater Wind, which we acquired. And so the leadership team that made those you know, decisions to start in Block Island, I think I, I know them, Jeff Grabowski and others, you know, they, um, they saw a specific need where the island itself wasn't connected to the grid onshore. And they were bringing diesel out to the island every day and running five big diesel generators to, to power the to power the island. And so if you're going to do a pilot of a small offshore wind farm, the economic benefit of getting off of diesel and also connecting back to, to the grid, they got internet, high-speed internet access, and they got backfeed power. So when the wind's not blowing, the power now flows back from the mainland. And when the wind is blowing, they actually power more than the island. Mm. The, the electrons flow through that that cable back to the mainland. And the Block Island Wind Farm actually powers mainland Rhode Island. Uh, ma many people probably don't realize that. But, um, and so it was just a good place to, to start and they had support from the state, et cetera. And so it really showed, you know, that Block Island, that, sorry, that Rhode Island could be a, a leader in this, in this uh, innovative space, so. Interesting. And then there's another one that you guys are pulling up that should be online by, I think it's 2035, that's off the coast of Newport and Little Compton. 2025. 2025 uh, in yeah. just a couple of years. Yes. So it's called the Revolution Wind Revolution Wind uh, Project. It's um, quite a bit larger. The Block Island Wind Project is 30 megawatts. So if you don't speak energy, just think 30. Um, and the Revolution is 704 megawatts. So it's significantly larger. Um, and we'll, we'll power um, 400 megawatts in Rhode Island and 300 plus megawatts into Connecticut through the same grid, but the, the offtake, the procure of power is Connecticut and, and Rhode Island. And for that level of energy, how many turbines are we talking about? Um, I think it's 62. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we have been working on the development of this project since the late teens, probably 17, 18, um, and just got our final uh, environmental impact study from the federal government. So it's the second to last step in getting our federal permit. And we expect to get our record of decision, which is the final federal permit, um, in the next month or two. And then hopefully thereafter, we'll be able to take what's called a final investment decision, a FID. And we'll go to our board, get permission to spend the rest of the money needed to build the project and start construction later this year. Assuming so, that happens, great. what difference is that going to make in the life of an everyday Rhode Islander? Well, the total number of households, approximate number of households at that wind farm will power is around 350,000 households. So 350,000 households across Connecticut and Rhode Island will now have 100% clean energy. Um, and we can have the discussion about cost again. At the time, people thought that maybe Revolution was a high price option, but if you compare the peak prices that were paid last winter to the long-term levelized price of Revolution Wind, it's actually significantly cheaper. And that's today, and this is a, 30 to 35 year asset. So it might actually be really inexpensive hmm. uh, to have offshore wind uh, through through revolution. And this is again, our the debate that we need to have with uh, Rhode Island Energy and maybe the R Rhode Island regulators about, about revolution two. Do you think that there is recourse for revolution two? Is there a way that that project could be revived, do you think? I think we're exploring all of, all of our options right now. There are some procedural steps. Uh, Rhode Island Energy has to make a recommendation to the PUC. We can comment. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. You know, you're obviously, you got Revolution Wind, you got Revolution Wind 2, you have South Fork as well, which is going to bring its power to Long Island. That's currently under construction right now. People in Newport might have seen that big ship come in. 
How is that going so far? You were telling us a little bit early before we started recording, but going to see some of that work. Tell us a little bit about that. How the, how's that going so far? I think it's super exciting. This is the first commercial scale you know, project being built in America. We're kind of competing with Vineyard Wind, which is a Massachusetts project built by one of our competitors. Uh, but our project's a little smaller than theirs, and so it will for sure be completed before them, and it will be the first completed commercial scale project uh, in America and expected to be completed by the end of this year first power onto the grid this fall. We've got five foundations installed so far. We've got our first U.S. built offshore substation, which is a big, basically like a big transmission um, system where the power is converted and conditioned. Um, that the, the platform was built down in Texas and it's sitting actually up in Profport right now and will be installed in the next weeks or so. We've got the foundation for that already installed. Um, and then we'll, we're, we've got components coming over to our port in New London, Connecticut, where they're doing pre, pre-assembly there of towers, towers and nacelles and blades are on their way. So this is like real time. I joke today with my team that can't say the rubber meets the road, but I can say the bow meets the water. This is happening as we speak. It's, so I think it's just tremendously exciting to, to see these milestones happening. And like I said, we expect to, we got our record of decision on our New Jersey project, Ocean Wind One. We haven't talked about that yet, but that's the largest project in America. Um, and we expect to take FID on that and start const- onshore construction this year. And we've got a second New York project called Sunrise Wind, which we also expect to take uh, to get our final permit late this year, early next year, and take a final investment decision there. So we, we will likely have four projects in construction at the same time, maybe three if we finish up sunri- uh, South Fork quickly. In, in terms of that, so, I mean, obviously, everyone recently especially is talking about climate change. Um, the Paris Agreement, which most people should be familiar with, but 195 members of, you know, our signatories to it, we rejoined as America, Biden rejoined in 2021, um, and it basically anticipates by 2030 reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52 percent, um, our carbon out outputs versus 2005 levels. There are many, even within the Orsted portfolio of clean energy solutions, opportunities to to do better. What is the role specifically of offshore wind and why is it such a powerful or least powerful player um, within the portfolio of clean energy that gets us to those uh, targets? Yeah, maybe a little context first. So we didn't we didn't actually talk about this yet, but I run the Americas for Orsted. I we were building onshore solar projects, onshore wind projects. We're actually building a solar plus storage project in Arizona that's the second largest commercial scale battery in the world. Um, We have a green green fuels business as well where we're building green methanol to power ships and other things. But offshore wind is our core kind of signatory uh, technology and brand. Like I said, we built the world's first offshore wind farm. We've been building them for over 30 years, and we have by far the world's largest market share. What's unique about, I think all of that stuff is important. That's why I brought it up. So we need all of it um, in order to achieve these these climate goals. But, But offshore wind is particularly interesting. If you look at our demographics of our country, you've got highly densely populated cities along both coasts, and even this, even the Gulf Coast is fairly highly populated, Houston, second largest city in America, I think now. Um, and so you can build a bunch of solar out in Arizona or wind in Kansas, but there's not a, as many users of that power um, in certain parts of the country. And so then you would have to have massive, expensive transmission lines with lots of losses to br- get the power out. But with offshore wind, you can build the, the generating asset close to the load. And we have actually some fundamental things uh, that make offshore wind attractive, especially in the northeast and mid-Atlantic part of the U.S. We have relatively shallow waters pretty far off. So it's called a, uh, a shallow continental shelf that goes pretty far offshore. So you create a lot of seabed that you can build offshore wind on. And we have high wind speeds. And people don't probably realize, but power generation is a cubed function of wind speed. So if you double the wind speed, you eight times the power generation. It's just the way the physics work. And so when you have high wind speeds, you can have pretty efficient power power generation. Um, and so offshore wind becomes a critical tool in the tool belt for America to achieve its climate 
climate ambitions, and especially for these eastern seaboard cities in the near term and eventually on the west, you know, the water's a lot deeper there, so they'll have a different technology for, for floating uh, foundations. But, but, you know, California, high, high population density, um, offshore wind will be important for them as well. So obviously people, commercial fishing interests have raised concerns about it. Shoreline property owners have raised concerns about it. How do you counter people's concerns about it? What's what's the message to primarily the commercial fishermen who, who worry about how it's going to affect their way of life? In Rhode Island, there have been some conflicts over that. Yeah, I mean, one of the big challenges we have is just generic fear of the unknown and disinformation and sometimes funding by people who want to keep the status quo, oil and gas companies, for example, um, we're really committed to coexistence. So we really are, have we have a large what we call a marine affairs organization in house, where we're talking to the fishing community and other marine ocean users. Uh, on a, we've had literally hundreds and hundreds of meetings. We've set up um, funds to help compensate for gear loss. Um, we we're very data driven, so we've done lots of analysis about you know how will fisher persons be impacted by by these wind farms. We've had very specific layouts. We have a one nautical mile um, by one nautical mile um, layout so that fishing entities and others uh, can can navigate through the wind farms. Um, and so we really just believe in, in in coexistence, and we're really trying to 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 help the the, the fishermen understand that that this isn't going to completely change their way of life. Visual impact's a little harder because it's kind of eyes in the beauty of the of the beholder. I w- spent last week I was in the UK. I did two days of training so that I could go offshore and flew into the Hornsey Two project off the east coast of the UK. It's the largest wind farm in the world. Um, f- flew offshore. And I saw literally hundreds of wind turbines out there. And it, I sometimes wish I could take these people with me because to me, it was amazing to see. And it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't um, you know, uh, a negative view shed from, from my perspective. But the truth is that these projects are, are pretty far offshore. You're not going to see them most of the time. On any hazy day like today, you won't see them at all. And even on a clear day, they're going to be an inch or two tall on the horizon pretty far offshore so it's not they're not like big giant looming um you know wind turbines that are sitting right at you know 100 yards off your beach or something do you think they're making any difference any of the opponents there was recently a, a commercial campaign that that was announced to counter some of the stuff about whales about some of some of the opposition do you think the opposition is making it harder to get these projects done like i said i think if you trace the funding of some of these campaigns you you, you can you'll see that it's it's typically being funded by by oil and gas interests, which is which is disappointing. Um, but 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 you know it's it's our job too to 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 educate people and make sure that they understand you know the the reality and that they don't that they don't get disinformation about about vis- visuals or whale strandings or other um, other negative misinformation that's that's shared out there. So. As, as we think about uh, wrapping up, because these are pretty quick conversations, um, one of the things that I think is interesting, you mentioned um, about obviously in Europe and Denmark specifically, there's a much longer history. The benefits to the local economies, there are obviously uh, drawbacks and, and, and barriers, but what are some of the benefits um, that, that you see um, that you guys are bringing to the state of Rhode Island and, and beyond now as you expand? Yeah, if I look across Rhode Island, just a quick because I don't think we talked about this, but we've got 100 workers or so here in Providence that are working on our engineering procurement, construction, marine affairs, permitting, development, you know, th- those types of jobs, white collar jobs. We've um, we've got a, in Quonset, we've got our operation and maintenance hub there. That's where the helicopter, we've got five, we will have five what's called crew transport vessels where we'll put techs on the vessels to go out and and service all of these wind farms, not just the Rhode Island ones, but the New York based, the New York ones as well. We'll have a, a, a hub there. Um, we've we've built the Provport, uh, what's called secondary steel manufacturing facility. Those are union workers that built that facility and that are building the components there. They're part of the foundation of the wind farm. We've built these five boats in in, in Rhode Island, and we expect to build more. 
Um, and so we're kind of have quite a bit of impact on, on the state of Rhode Island. So I guess at, one of the major benefits, of course, is the the economic impact of, of all this, the, the job creation that, that comes from this. And so you've got these you've got a mix of white collar and blue collar jobs, union jobs, non-union jobs, but it's they're all pretty high paying jobs. If you're a wind turbine technician, you don't, don't have to have a degree. It's with overtime. It's a probably a, you know, pretty, pretty good job compared to you know, maybe working in, in, in a warehouse or something. Um, and so, uh, I mean, we, we, we train people, we've, we hired our first nine technicians like 18 months before they were first gonna have to go offshore and we sent them to Texas to work onshore and we sent them to the UK to work offshore. But these are, these are folks now that'll have a, you know, 30 year job if they want it, um, high paying job working in the offshore wind industry, so. Last question is always, um, where do you see, I mean, you also spent eight years as a Navy veteran in, in, in su did various positions in submarines. I mean, you spent a lot of time around the ocean. You've been in renewables and, and offshore wind most of your career. What do you see as the future and what's your greatest hope for the long-term future of offshore wind? Look, I, I'm doing this job because I believe in in what we're trying to do, not least in trying to preserve the, the, the you know, get the benefits of the environmental, you know, uh, rising temperature. And there's a lot of things that have happened just recently here in, in New England uh, that we can point to that show that this is a challenge that we need to overcome. But, but I also get quite motivated to see um, the job creations. Um, and we're doing a lot to to kind of work with, um, you know, a, the just transition and environmental justice communities and create jobs in our in our union agreements. We have high standards for bringing in uh, women and and people of for, from diverse backgrounds. And so I think it's a it's a pretty unique role to create something good for the for the world and help us you know transition to the next next phase of the energy transition but also to change people's lives actually and make a difference for people and i've i've talked to to people who've come up to me already even people who worked on the block island wind farm and said that that block island wind farm allowed me to buy my first home he was, there was a painter a union painter that did a lot of work on on that project and i can imagine that there would be hundreds if not thousands of those types of stories that that we can have an impact on so maybe for me, the future is a lot of offshore wind, a domestic supply chain, trained workforce, and just you know a, a real significant difference in in the way we generate power along the east coast of, of the U.S. in the next you know 10, 15 years. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Dave, for joining us. Thank you for joining us on this week's special edition of Future of XYZ in co-production with Rhode Island Report from the Boston Globe and, as always, Rhode Island PBS. We thank David Hardy and Orsted for joining us for this special edition. If you didn't know, you can find Future of XYZ anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. You can also watch at ripbs.org forward slash XYZ. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Future of XYZ and feel free to visit future of XYZ if you want to nominate yourself or anyone else as a guest. We look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. Be sure to leave us a five-star review.